Sawete Womnes. Welcome back to another week of AP Latin Review. That very important essay will be our focus today, along with book one of Virgil's Aeneid. After reviewing De Bello Gallico last week and practicing the skills needed for each question type on the exam, this week we'll turn our attention to Virgil's Aeneid, his magnum opus, and do the same with um, each book of the Aeneid. You'll leave today's review ready to face that essay that is worth so many points on the AP Latin exam, and you'll be feeling more confident about the task. My name is Jenny Luongo. I teach Latin at St. Andrew's Episcopal School in Austin, Texas, and I'm honored to be here with Ben Johnson. Salve, Jenny. Welcome back. I, I know you said that this is Virgil's magnum opus, but I think this is, uh, compared with Caesar, for me at least, this is the uh, maius opus, as to use Virgil's own words. Um, although we, Virgil says that about the second half of the Aeneid, and we only read the first half of the Aeneid uh, in AP Latin. So, quid hodie discamus, what will we learn today, the all-important thing? Um, so we're, as you said, going to focus on Aeneid Book 1, the Latin portions, um, along with the English reading, too from the Aeneid, uh, his adventures in Africa. Um, so we do sing of arms and the man that famous line uh, as Aeneas lands in Africa and travels to Carthage after a storm wrecks the Trojan fleet. That storm is a big part of the stuff that we read uh, in book one. Um, we're gonna gain confidence with your essay. And then we're also gonna talk a little bit about genre here because we're moving to a new genre now that we're gonna be reading um, uh, Virgil's Aeneid. Uh, and it's different from Caesar's Commentarius. So we're going to focus on that. I've got I've got not just one game, Jenny, because what's better than one game? <gasps> two games. So we're going to do two different games, uh, one about the Aeneid book one in English and the other one uh, about like what if you know the difference between an epic poem or a Commentarius. So this is going to be fun. So hopefully I'm on my game this week. It looks like we are joined here by Aeneas, too. <laughs> Oh, in Nawe. It, right, exactly. I mean, this is probably, hopefully this is this is pre-storm. Um, maybe this is uh, after he's regained uh, his his fleet and he's uh, traveling in, in book five or six or something like that. Uh, so so uh, first let's talk a little bit about Virgil's Zinnia. This is really my, uh, one of my, if not the uh, favorite work of literature. Um, and I would say that this is uh, fantastic if, you know, one of the world's treasures here. Uh, this is Rome's national epic. Uh, it's commissioned by Augustus uh, and in a way to um, kind of promote the glory of Rome. Um, but there's a lot there that isn't just propaganda. Uh, 12 books loosely based on episodes from Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. Um, you could say that it's kind of like fan fiction, but it's more than that. You could say that it's a little plagiarized, but it's not. It's more than that. Um, what Virgil does with Homer's works is he takes uh, episodes from that and then re uh, turns them into something that makes them uh, unique and his own and fits a completely different narrative with completely different uh, goals in mind here. Uh, it focuses on the travels of the Trojan hero Aeneas uh, from the fall of Troy to wars that he fights uh, in Italy in order to establish his band of Trojan refugees um, in Italy and give them um, a safe haven from all of the troubles that they've had. And one important thing too with Virgil's Aeneid is that it's written in dactylic hexameter, which is a, a meter that forces um, the poet to have a specific order of long and short syllables uh, that is sometimes fun to figure out that order, um, but also gives it its, uh, its poetic feel to it. So um, love dactylic hexameter. It's just one of many different possible patterns that poets used in the ancient world though when they were writing their poetry. So here is a map of uh, the Mediterranean. If you look almost right smack dab in the middle, you can see where Troy is in what is now modern day Turkey on the northwest portion of Turkey. Um, and uh, you might know it as Asia Minor um, as its uh, term as a, a Roman province. And Aeneas is going to take his band of Trojan refugees and sail all around the uh, Mediterranean before uh, he lands for a little bit in Carthage uh, where we were gonna spend a whole lot of time in book one, in book four, um, until finally making it to Italy and uh, 
well, the Naples area for his trip to the underworld, and then finally in the future site of Rome. So Jenny, why don't you tell us what happens a little bit in the uh, the Latin that we read in book one? Happy to. Um, so we've separated out the Latin reading from the English one. Sometimes it's really helpful to know what happens in the Latin reading so that when you get the passage on, for instance, the essay, you can situate where it is happening in the narrative. Um, so we read the epic from the beginning, and we immediately learn, um, even before Aeneas's name, that Juno has beef with the Trojans. She is angry at the Trojans. So she goes to Aeolus, and she asks him to create a storm that will destroy the Trojan fleet. Um, Aeneas, luckily, after um, the storm is calmed by Neptune, um, along with seven of his ships survive, and they end up landing on the coast of Libya in Africa near the city of Carthage. Aeneas then travels to Carthage and um, sees this city bustling, this new city bustling with activity um, while he is um, Cyptus Nebula, hidden in a cloud that his mother Venus has provided, um, he sees another group of Trojans that have survived the storm separately, um, led by Ilioneus. He sees them approach the Queen Dido and ask her for help, um, for hospitality. Um, and that's about what we read in the Latin. So now shall we talk about the English reading since we're expected to know all of book one. Sure. Would you say the Carthaginians are as busy as bees when they're oh, making their city? Oh, they are definitely busy bees. Um, that great, uh, we read several great epic similes in book one, but the uh, simile of the bees is a, uh, a very famous one. So let's talk about what happens in the other parts of book one that we don't read. Um, so after um, Juno stirs up the storm, um, via Venus, Aeneas's mother, is very disturbed by the fact that Aeneas has been pushed off um, his route again. So she goes to her dad, Jupiter. I, I call him her daddy at this point because she kind of begs him almost like a child. And she's like, daddy, um, how have you let this happen to my Aeneas? Um, Jupiter reassures her. He says the fates are unchanged for Aeneas. Aeneas is still going to be able to found the Roman race and do all of the great things that Venus is expecting him to. Um, and so at that point, um, Jupiter even tells her that he has given the Romans imperium, empire, power, sine fine, without end. Um, this, uh, you know, idea that the Romans have that they're destined to be rulers. Um, so Venus um, hurries down to Carthage to help Aeneas out, but she doesn't show her full form as a goddess. She comes dressed as a huntress. Um, and Aeneas right away knows that something's up. He tells her that she's surely a goddess, but she says, oh, no, I'm just wandering around these woods looking for my sisters. Um, but she uses the opportunity to tell Aeneas the key information he needs to know about Dido, um, sends him off to Carthage. Aeneas gets to Carthage, sees a temple with um, freezes from the Trojan War. He knows that they know about the Trojans, and this is perhaps an opportunity for safety. At this Quick point- question. Quick yeah. question on that. Whose temple is it? Oh, it's a temple to Juno. Um, Juno, you know. the one who hates Aeneas? Juno, the one who hates Aeneas, but Juno loves Carthage. We learn early on in the first 30 lines of uh, the Aeneid. Yeah, if you look at those uh, those pictures and you see them from Aeneas's perspective, it's like, oh, these people are fantastic. They understand our story. They will have sympathy. But if you look at it maybe from a, a Juno perspective, it's like, oh, these people are celebrating the destruction of Troy. Right. Yeah. Really fun. And that's the great thing about the Aeneid, honestly, is that nothing's black and white, right? right. Everything's in shades of gray, which is what keeps us reading it. Um, so Aeneas, again, he's Cyptus Nebula. Venus has protected him in a cloud so he can go around Carthage um, uh, undiscovered. Um, and so in his cloud, he sees um, Ilioneus, 
Um, and that delegation we were talking about come up and speak to Dido. And once Dido responds and he knows that um, they will be safe, he pops out of his cloud, says, sum pius Aeneas, as we heard him say earlier. Um, and uh, Dido welcomes him in the Trojans, invites them to a banquet where Aeneas um, gives Dido all sorts of gifts. Um, notably, he gives her um, Helen's wedding dress when she was getting married to Paris and Troy. Um, at this banquet, um, Venus has sent Aeneas's brother Cupid, his half-brother, disguised as Ascanius, Aeneas's son. His job is to make Dido fall in love with Aeneas. So at that point, and Dido looks at Aeneas and says, hey, Aeneas, tell me your story. And that's when we start heading into book two. Which is a nice uh, two book flashback, but we'll get to that tomorrow, right? Yes, okay. tomorrow we'll talk about that. So let's do uh, let's do our first of two games here. This is uh, characters in book one. I'm going to so you see this what this five by four little matrix here um, with various different colors. They're arranged in uh, well, not quite alphabetical order, but pretty close to make it annoying if you really look hard about the the different alphabetical orders. Something is out of order. I will tell you that. Um, and yet, uh, I'm going to uh, ask you to classify these. Pick out the ones that fit in a certain description. OK, are you ready? Okay, parata soon. Okay. Not a parata, born ready. <laughs> Great, OK. Uh, so the first thing is, is I want to know from you, Jenny Luongo, which one of these are divinities? OK, so I'm going to scan down. OK, you're going to go I down see... rather than across? OK. I see Neptune. Now I'm going across Pallas Minerva, all okay. divinities, even Olympians. Um, Deopea, minor divinity, a nymph. So I'll put her in there. Um, Cupid, Aeneas's brother, definitely a divinity. Um, Aeolus, the king of the winds, he's a minor deity. Um, and then we've got Juno, Jupiter, and Venus, all Olympians. So I think I got them all. Okay, so uh, is this... What you said? This is what you said. This is this yeah. is a lot. So yeah, I think you said all of these. Okay. Moving forward. Uh, which one of these are Trojans? Which ones of these? Okay. So I see um Akates, Aeneas's BFF to start. Um Fetus definitely. Akates, yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, and then we've got Ascanius, Aeneas's son. Hector, the greatest of the Trojan warriors, in the is in this list. I see him there. Okay. Um let's see. Um I'm skipping Helen, you know, Why? we call her Helen of Troy, but she was really Greek in terms of her um, culture of origin. Um, <clears throat> Ilianaeus, he was the one who okay. led that delegation to talk to Dido. Did yeah. I say Aeneas? Because I should have. Uh, um, Aeneas who? Who's this Aeneas guy? <laughs> no stair heroes, our, our <laughs> hero of the Aeneid. Um, his dad, Anchises, and Anchises, okay. I think I got him. Did you? Okay. Uh, let's double check. Uh, hopefully I got them right too. So yes, that's right. That's right. Uh, Escanius, why does he have another name? Well, um, so according to the Aeneid, um, he was called um, Ulysses while Troy um, Restot was still standing, mm -hmm. um, but it conveniently so connects conveniently. the Julian clan who claims descent from Aeneas's family. It conveniently co connects the Julian clan, like Julius Caesar, Augustus, his um, adoptive son, um, all the way back to Aeneas. So they, yeah. this is also not only the origin of the Roman race, but it's their family origin story. Yeah, turn that turn that I, that first I and the first letter there into a J, and you yeah. get Julius. So yeah, it also is, Virgil does a really, um, I don't know, good job, hard job of trying to uh, connect Ulysses in with the word like Ili that w is related to the word Iliad too. So as that whole little Trojan thing. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, off that sidetrack, which of these now are Greeks? Okay, so um, I've eliminated most of them. So this should be easier. So Achilles. <laughs> but do you remember which ones you've <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So Achilles, greatest of okay. the Greek warriors. Okay. Um, Helen, I mentioned okay. I was going to classify yep. her as Greek Agreed. earlier. Yep. And then... <laughs> Diomedes, who is mentioned in book one as a great Greek warrior who almost killed Aeneas, but his mother Venus rescued him out of that okay. battle. 
he pricked her he pricked venus in the wrist right with his yeah. spear too yeah book five of the iliad if i remember all right yeah oh, okay are you done i was gonna say i, I think i'm done okay. just those three okay <laughs> yeah, it is just those three okay okay I was and looking. what about Tyrians? which ones of these are Tyrians? do you know what a Tyrian is so the Tyrians come from the city tyre um not and to be confused with Troy, right? Exactly. Although they look yeah. a lot alike. They do. And just think, Aeneas and Dido's backgrounds are similar and their cities are spelled alike. There's no a lot way. of connections here. I know, it's uh, Mirabile. Um, so um, the uh, Dido um, emigrated okay. from Tyre to um, found Carthage. Okay. Um, and so um, here we go. We've got Dido. Her husband, Sicaeus, okay. um, who was killed back at Tyre, and um, he was killed by her brother Pygmalion, which caused oh. her to be a refugee like Aeneas. So I think those are the three. Just those three? Those are the only Tyrians that I think so. Are, okay. Yeah, of any account. Yeah. Yeah. In book one. Okay. Uh, nice job, Jenny. Uh, so far, you're batting a thousand on all of these little quizzes. I have yet to stump you. Uh, well, um, you know, uh, we've still got a week. <laughs> we've still got a week. All okay, right. Let's harder. do. <laughs> let's do some reminders about the essay that you're going to be writing. We did an essay review last week. So um, now we're going to do some more practice and some more review. Remember, the essay is a big part of your overall score. So it's important to attempt the essay. Certainly scoring a one on the essay is better than scoring a zero, but we really want you to aim to get up to a three or higher. And we've talked about how to do that. You must quote and translate or paraphrase Latin to get a score higher than a two. So that's what we're aiming at. We're gonna talk a lot today about how to um, quote and translate that, that Latin in your essay. Um, you want to write your um, essay running through the passages in order of the text. There's no need to jump around and make connections. Your goal in the essay is to show your reader that you understand Latin. Um, so pick strategic phrases and clauses, not individual Latin words to quote. And also don't quote an entire paragraph and then translate it. It's not the literal translation. You're writing an essay with these strategic phrases and quotes as your evidence. You want to address both passages so that you can get a score higher than three. You can write a really good essay about one passage and get um, a score of three basically, but we're aiming for higher than three. So we want to address both passages quoting Latin from throughout both of them. Um, we've talked about that strategy of dividing the passages into three sections and making sure that you have quotations from each of those three sections. We, we don't have a centurion this week to uh, remind us to divide, just yes. like Gaul was divided into three parts. So We're going to have to rely on our P.S. Aeneas friend. Eesh, eesh. Sometimes <laughs> he's, he's a little absent. <laughs> like he is sometimes different parts of the Aeneid, which is kind of interesting. So let's go to Italy. Or at least at least let's try to go to Italy, Jenny. Yes, let's look at some examples from the Latin. So in book one, we see defesti Aeneidae contendimus. We tired people of Aeneas, we are aiming, we're stretching towards something. Ah, we're aiming petere cursu litora quae proxima to seek the shores which are closest on our course because we've just been in a shipwreck which hopefully that's not what our essay is going to be it's not going to be a shipwreck um no. but <laughs> at libuai where timor ad oras and we're turned to the shores of libya of africa so here is our sampi sample essay analysis um we have taken two different passages from book one um, and they're both Aeneas's speech. Um, and uh, we were going to kind of go through like how we would address this if this were an essay question on the AP exam. Um, so we see Aeneas speaking in two different situations here. Uh, in a well-developed essay, analyze what each speech shows about either his character or about human nature more generally. That's a, that's a tall task here. Um, okay, so in thinking about this essay, we really want to come up with like that big unifying question that we're answering here. That general question is like, what does the speech say about his character? So um, let's see, I'm gonna take A, Jenny, and you're gonna take B. 
I think, okay, if that's got okay. it. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so this first bit, um, let's see. Okay, passage A. Um, it's I actually I, I cheated a little bit and I looked at the line citation and realized this is uh, book one, line ninety-two to one hundred and one. And I know, maybe because I've taught this a lot, but um, the first time that the word that the name Aeneas shows up in the Aeneid is line ninety-two, even though it's his epic, which is a little strange, but hey. We got to pay attention to Juno first. Um, and so this is the first time that he comes in. And I know that this, the first time he comes in, he's uh, in the storm and he's uh, afraid for his life. So um, that's going to give me a good place to start from, even before I get to his speech. Because, you know, as we said last week, the, uh, the people that created, that chose this passage and created the question, chose something to, so it chose a place to start with. So I probably really want to think about like, well, what in those first couple of lines is relevant to this question? Uh, and it's not his speech that's relevant, but his actions here. And so that's what I'm going to start with. So we first start off in, uh, in well, in the first line, his limbs are slackened with a chill. Um, but the actions really that kind of illustrate his character here is this in gamut, he groans. Um, and uh, while holding up, both of his uh, his palms to the stars. So he's really, uh, he is not in a good spot right now. Um, and we know that he is afraid for his life and that he is uh, sad. And he, well, later on, we're gonna find out that he wishes that he were dead or had died already. Um, so that's that first bit here. His actions speak louder than his words. Then when we get to his words, we find out he says something about O oh, terque qua terque beati, O oh, three and four times blessed are those for whom you know it happened that they they fell. Um, this con ticket all petre in death. Um, Antora patrum troiae submoinibus alti. So before the faces of their fathers and uh, under the high walls of Troy. So he's really recalling the uh, the Trojan War here. And he's suggesting that dying a death in battle is far more honorable than what he's feeling like he's experiencing right now. And that would be death at sea. Um, he's unable to get buried, which is a key thing that we see in the Aeneid, because um, we'll find out in book six that if you are unburied, then you have to wander around on um, the near side of the of the Styx or the Acheron for a hundred years until you can cross into the underworld. So, um, so he's really kind of wishing that he had died and that he had gone through something that was honorable rather than something that is maybe not as honorable a way to die. And then he recalls um, the Trojan War again. He does reference this guy Diomedes, uh, who's here as two today. Um, and he says that, um, oh, he wishes that, uh, that he, he bemoans the fact, how about I'll put it this way, that he wasn't able to die, um, Iliakis Campis, on uh, Trojan fields, and to pour out a fundera, his soul, um, by means of your right hand. So he's talking now to Diomedes, um, and he's, again, referencing book well, referencing book five of the Iliad, if, as if Aeneas knew ho his Homer. I'm sure he did. I'm um, sure. Yeah. And he's really uh, talking about this hero's death. Um, so I'm going to suggest that this speech, just to kind of sum it up, because I've divided into the beginning, middle, and end here, shows that um, Aeneas is maybe fearful. And he's maybe uh, thinking about the uncertainty of the situation. And uh, he's recalling the past and um, how uh, maybe humans in general are scared in dangerous situations. And maybe that's okay. Maybe that's okay. But, oh, here he comes just to judge me. Let's see. He says, ter beati. He says, three times blessed, I guess. That must be um, three times blessed to have divided up this passage three times. Okay. Yeah, uh, I agree with Aeneas. Okay, let's do passage B, Jenny. Okay, so yeah, I, I like the way um, Ben talks about um, how um, in that first passage, we get to see Aeneas in this very human moment. It's a kind of a private moment. He's not really necessarily speaking to anybody. Um, and so we see him um, nervous, scared, terrified, actually. Um, but here in this second speech, um, I would point out that here we see Aeneas the leader, right? <clears throat> He's talking to his men. And so um, 
he starts out by addressing them. He says, oh, Soki, oh, allies. And then he says, oh, Posse Grawi Ora, oh, those who have endured more serious things. Um, and then he encourages them by saying, day you stop it. God will give Phenem an end, heast to these things, quoque, also. Um, <clears throat> so that's where I would start in this particular passage. Which, which, God, which God is he referring to? Um, you know, I, I don't know. And I've always thought it was so interesting that he uses the singular day use. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, uh, I don't want you to answer that. So. Yeah. Some God, some God. Right. Um, and so he can, he, you know, after telling them a few of the things that they have endured, like the madness of Scylla and the Cyclopean rocks, um, he encourages them even more. He says, with these imperatives, and it's okay in your essay to mention things like grammatical structure. Um, he uses the imperatives and he says, Rewo kat animos, call back your spirits, recall your spirits, my stumque temora mitite, and send away your gloomy fear, which of course is um, ironic since the first time we see Aeneas, he's very fearful, right? He's um, speaking from experience. <laughs> exactly, exactly. He says, for sonnet hike olim eminisa you up it. Perhaps one day it will help to remember at hike, even these things. Um, and then he reminds them that they are tendimus in latium. They're aiming for Latium, this area of Italy, ubi, where fata ostendunt, the fates show them sedes quietas, quiet places to settle. Um, and he says, illic, there, fos, it is right, fos est, for the regna troi, I, the kingdoms of Troy, re sergere, to rise again. And yeah. then, uh, just, well, you know, you know, my love of this word fos, where it's kind of not just like, it's right for this to happen, but it's like, divinely inspired here right it's, it's according fate. to the right it's it's the world order that troy right. rise again and so then we need to make sure again that we've divided our passage into three and that we're still covering something from the end of that passage um so he goes back to those imperatives and he tells them to um durate persevere and woes met this is y'all this is this very <laughs> emphatic y'all you plural and he says, y'all, Serwate, watch out for Rebus Secundis, favorable things that are going to happen to us. This is one of my favorite things, and I think this is one thing that good leaders have to do. Um, at this point, Aeneas stops speaking, and Virgil tells us that he simulat spem. Um, he pretends hope, wool to, with his expression, I gear sick curis in gentibus, with huge cares. He doesn't even know where they are. But as a leader, he has to prem it. He has to repress this altum dolorum, this deep pain corde in his heart and encourage his men. Um, okay, what, what, uh, what figure of speech is found in line 209? Um, in line 209, that last one, I think yeah. it's probably a um, chiasmus because we've got object, verb, verb in the middle, object. Yeah, it's actually even more than that. You have object, ablative, verb, verb, skip altum because it's just an adjective, um, ablative object there. And so you've got this, this hope with his expression, he's feigning. And then, so we work ourselves down through that chasm, and then we work ourselves back up with the complete opposite thing. So it's like we reverse the order of the actions and we reverse the meaning of those actions too. So pretty cool. That, that is a pretty cool chiasmus, if you ask me. Yeah, no, I love that line. Tear, do we see? It has been divided three times into three parts so nice remember job. remember kids to do that so you gave yourself a three on that essay maybe a four i no i think we got a five on that essay five. okay did, good i mean good. we did great we did great but exerke almost let's practice some more okay so um so in the passages that follow caesar and dido so we're going to mix the caesar passage in here because you could see a caesar virgil um passage on the essay. So Caesar, the character, and Dido respond to requests from foreigners to pass through their territories. In a well-developed essay, analyze how both Caesar and Dido reveal their leadership styles in their responses. So we're going to focus on leadership here. Okay, Jenny, you got that? All right, that sounds I'll, good. I'll take passage A, you do passage B. Okay, I, th I really do think we can write a five essay together, so that's good. Uh, I, I only want to write essays with you. 
<laughs> Sounds makes it, it makes it easier to <laughs> a lot easier. To, right <laughs> divide and conquer okay uh so here is uh here's my passage this is uh from Golacor 1.7 so okay so knowing the context of this this is Caesar dealing with Helvetians but this is the very end of uh of what um of what we read in book one so that that gives me a pretty good perspective here okay leadership styles so let's um uh for you guys let's pause your video and again, this is practice. So um, you don't have to write the essay, but maybe like go through here and um, write down maybe some some the, the Latin that you might cite and maybe, or even just like put an outline together of like the different points that you'd make um, in an essay with this passage. And uh, we'll be back in, uh, well, when you're done, just pause the video and it's good. Okay, you think they've written their whole essay? I, th I think they're ready to go for this half okay. of it. So here we go. Um, so uh, let's divide it into three parts. So I kind of divide it. And something that you can think about when you have Caesar is that you can divide it based off of the punctuation. So we've got one sentence, and then we have another sentence, which has that semicolon, and then we end with the sentence. So that's actually a pretty good division here. Okay, so uh, Caesar and his leadership. So um, First thing, we find out that Caesar is informed um, of the fact that the Helvetians are wanting to travel through the province. And so Caesar responds with speed, and that's really important for his leadership when he hastens to set out uh, right from the city, uh, which happens to be Rome, and uh, he travels uh, quam maximis potest in Arabo. So with as great or as um, a long as possible um, journeys, probably be like the, the journeys you would take per day or in between um, posts um, to uh, further golf. So he wastes no time first off, and then he makes sure that when he travels, he's traveling as fast as possible. And then he finally gets to uh, Genawa. And so um, when he's there, now that he's, that he's shown good leadership, um, in getting there quickly, he needs resources. And so the first thing that he does is he looks around and he sees that Erat Omnino and Gallia uh, only legio una. So in all of Gaul, there is only one legion. And so the first thing that he does is he needs another, he needs more soldiers. And so he orders uh, quam maximum potest militum numerum. So that same sort of construction as large a number of soldiers as he could. Um, and that's, so he gets his resources, then he decides that he's going to um, order the bridge at Genawa to be cut down, pontem qui erat ad Genawam ubet res And then he uh, is, uh, decides to uh, talk to, or at least decides to formulate his plan about what he's going to do. Um, and because he, um, is remembering that something bad had happened to some previous Roman armies. This guy Cassius there, who was consul, um, he was killed. So that's Cassium consulum Ocisum, and that his army, Exercitum Eus, uh, was defeated by the Helvetians of Helvetii East Pulsum. And this phrase sent under the yoke. Um, they were, um, I don't know, embarrassed, um, um, poorly treated, um, suffered dishonor. Um, he decided already that um, it must not be granted this travel through their province, this concedendum non putavat. Okay, so then this last bit. So so he he gets his he gets his resources. He cuts down the bridge, and then he already formulates his plan because we know Caesar loves to formulate plans before uh, the actual business itself. So then. Um, he uh, was thinking that these Helvetians um, would not be able to refrain from doing bad things um, if they were to be granted. Um, also, this homines inimico animo, so people with a, with a, with an enemy mind, um, with the opportunity given data facultate of traveling through the province, perpowincium et teneris, faciendi, um, they would refrain from injury or malefice. Um, so he decides that um, he's going to uh, buy some time because he needs his soldiers to arrive. And so that's this purpose clause here, ut spatium inter catere posset, so that a space of time is able to um, kind of pass, go in the middle here um, for his soldiers, his milites, quos imperavera, that he had ordered to arrive. Um, he 
plays this delaying tactic. Um, Legatis responded. He responds to the legates that he would take up their matter for deliberating uh, on a certain day, and that day happens to be later. So, um, so he's um, he starts off by getting there as fast as he can. Then he realizes that he needs more resources, so he finds those. He already has in mind this idea that he shouldn't grant their them passage. Um, he orders the bridge cut down, which is probably going to be really important for buying some time. And then uh, he decides that he's going to um, buy some more time by um, delaying his message to the Helvetian ambassadors. How's that? I think that was great. Okay. Good job. Then I fucked you, him. You get the you get the virtual one though. Yeah, I'm I'm lucky here. So now we're gonna look at Dido's part of this essay. And again, you don't need to necessarily contrast Caesar and Dido. Um, we're gonna look at this Dido section and we're gonna write a good paragraph, a good essay about what is going on here. Um, so You'll notice here that we have some glosses on this passage. Typically, we don't get um, glossed words or dictionary entries um, for essays, but we gave you a, a few words here because we're just practicing today. Um, so we'll go ahead and pause um, the video and use that time to divide the passage up and determine what quotes you're going to take from the beginning, middle, and end. OK, they're done, right? I think they've totally finished. Okay. Uh, ready to go, ready to go. Okay, so we've divided this passage roughly into thirds. Um, and so, um, you know, if I were going to have a transition between the two, it's not absolutely necessary, but I might say something about how Caesar is in enemy territory, basically, um, in his passage. He's dealing with a hostile enemy, and Dido's in a different situation, right? She's the... the um, queen of a city and these people have come to her who are um, really refugees right who have had to flee from their city and so she's able to be more hospitable and more welcoming to them she immediately tells the two Greek, the trojans to um solvite corde metum to let go of the fear in their heart and secludite cura send away their concerns um just a side note, notice how um, Aeneas' speech uses all those imperatives. He and Dido are kind of um, linked in this way as they're showing their good leadership skills. Um, and then she reassures them um, that she knows who they are. She says, quis nesciat, who might not know about the genus Aeneidum, the people of Aeneas, who might not know about Troyi Urbem, the city of Troy? She's like, I've, I've heard of you. I, I know what happened to you. I know... Um, Tanti in Kendia belly. I know the fires of such a great war, right? She knows yeah, what's we, going on. We celebrated your loss on the <laughs> on my temple. Yeah, I've got this temple here. Okay, so um, then in the middle section, um, she um, you know tells them that you know whether um, they decide to head towards Italy or Phineas Ericus, the boundaries of um, the Sicilian king, um, in other words, or to head back to Sicily, she says, Dimitam tutos, I will send you away safe, auxilio, with help, opibusque uabo, and I will, will help you with my resources. So she basically reassures them that, that she's going to be helpful. Let's take a look at that last section. Um, in, in which she even offers, she even says, you know, do you want to um, consider a, um, to settle, make him with me, he's regnis in these kingdoms. She says, um, you know, est westra, this is yours, the city which I'm establishing. You know, I could use some people. I've got a new city too, right? And then she goes back to those imperatives. She says, lead up your ships. Um, so she says, tros tiriusque, those two um, different cultures here that often get easily confused. She says, um, Trojan and Tyrian alike will be, um, you know, handled, will be considered um, by me with nulo discriminate, with no discrimination between them. I'm happy to have you all here and welcome you. And then um, she mentions their king Aeneas, who 
they think is missing. But of course, he's Cyptus Nebula. He's hidden in that cloud right there. And she says, you know, Equidem, indeed, Dimitam, I will send Kertos, um, certain men, reliable men, per litera through the shores. Um, and you, Bebo, I'll order um, them to survey Lustrari, the furthest parts of Africa, um, if you know, Errat, he's wandering around um, Ejectus, uh, you know, ejected Silwis out Erebus from the forest or the city. So he's like, she's like, I'll even help you find um, your king. Um, so she shows herself here. Um, and uh, we talked about that. This shows that um, as your kind of very formulaic essay analysis. Um, she shows here that she's a queen who in many ways is, is secure in her kingdom and willing to show the expected hospitality to these people. And how did that work out for her? Um, not well, not how well did, at all. How did Caesar's rejection work out? His rejection Much better for him, people? which yeah, is I, a little I ironic, would, right? <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't judge your, uh, whether you should be nice <laughs> on on this. Yeah, uh, which, you know, this Roman value of hospitality, the Aeneid certainly makes us question it, right? Because Priam gets yeah. himself in the same trouble, um, right. which we'll talk about more tomorrow in book two. Oh, uh, Ludamus. Ludamus, I think it's game time again. Game number two. Sweet. Um, so we're going to we're gonna play a little game that I like to call commentarius out non-commentarius. So is this a commentary or not a commentary? I'm going to give you some selections of Latin, and you need to tell me if they are representative of Caesar's commentaries or um, something like Virgil's Aeneid, like more in the epic poem tradition. Okay, you ready? Nata Parata, born ready. Oh, <laughs> I see. Um, uh, and, and you uh, need to tell me why. You need to tell me why. Too. Yeah, you I was going to say, this one's yeah. pretty easy because I see Ah uh, Kaisare. But yeah. here we've got um, Caesar writing about himself in the commentarius in third person. But he's also, this is the part where he mentions himself as Caesar, the author. So Camius Atrebos, he mentions this um, guy, which I have shown previously um, was sent by Caesar, me, but Caesar the general, into Britain. So commentarius, definitely. There we go. Yeah, it's a commentary. Okay, very good. That was that was an easy one just to kind of get you going. Get me going. It's okay. What about this one? Uh, I this one I think also I feel confident about because it starts Musa. Uh, Muse, mihi causas memora, you know, remember the reasons for me. So this is the invocation um, of the muse from the beginning of the Aeneid. So this is non commentarius. Yeah, this is definitely something you'll see in um, in an epic poem or even just a regular poem. Yeah, Caesar does not invoke the muse. That's important. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is our friend, um, Sumpius Aeneas. I think we've covered that this is definitely in the Aeneid, but one reason you know it is because, um, you know, there's these standard epithets that characters have in epic poetry. So um, Pius is always Aeneas's. He's loyal. This is an epic, non commentarius. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Oh, man, I see lots of geography here. Um, so um, the, Garu the Garonne River, the Garumna River divides the, divides the Gauls from the Aquitani, the Marne and the Seine, the Matrona and the Sequana divide them from the Belgians. Geographic descriptions, definitely a characteristic of commentarius. So commentarius. Yes. There yes. we go. We have, to, we have to create our map, right? <laughs> exactly. Map okay. Words. Yeah. So... Um, the guy who was carrying the eagle of the 10th legion is what I see. Qui, uh, okay. de yeah, decem my legionis aquilam gerebat. Um, he, you know, having like sworn to the gods so that things would happen. Um, Felicitaire, happily, luckily for his legion, he encourages the soldiers. De silite, jump down, soldiers. So this is one of those. Um, uh, things from the commentarius that's like um, the highlighting of a heroic common man. So commentarius. Commentarius. There for we go. Sure. Yeah. For yeah, sure. For sure. It's you. I don't think you could scan this. So it's definitely not a poem. But. Yeah. It's, it looks like. Um, okay. So um, I see Qualis. 
Okay. Um, so that usually starts um, a simile like, and typically you see epic similes, longer um, extended similes in epic poetry. Okay. So here we've got like Diana trains her choruses on the banks of the Eurotas River in Sparta, out toward Peruga Kunti through the ridges of Mount Kinthus. Um, I think this is comparing Dido and Diana, like Virgil likes to link people with um, alliteration. Uh, mm -hmm. Epic simile, known commentarius. There we go. Yes, it's epic yeah. simile. Very good. Okay. okay. What about this one? All right. In Omni Gallia, in all Gaul, well, okay, that's, that's a, a big clue right yeah. there. <laughs> um, genera sunt duo. There are two types, aorum hominum, of these men. So descriptions of um, the culture of yeah. um, other nations, definitely commentarius. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Nice job. Okay. So quid nunc sciamus, what should we know now? All sorts of things, right? Um, I hope we've, so. <laughs> we've reviewed um, Aeneid Book One, both the part that you're supposed to read in Latin and the part that you're supposed to read in English. We've learned about how um, Aeneas, in this very personal moment, um, is terrified during the storm, but then he lands in Carthage, pulls himself together, leads his men to meet Dido, where she gives them shelter. We've also talked about practicing that AP Latin essay again, dividing into three parts, using those words. This shows us that to complete our analysis. Um, and we've talked about the characteristics of um, epic poetry and commentaries, which can be um, part of those questions that they might ask you about Roman culture. Oh, so uh, he, Aeneas was Aeneas, not much of a help for us today. I don't think. Uh, but he tells us, he encourages us, Wos meant y'all, serwate, watch out for favorable things, rebus secundis. So I like that. Okay. Which brings us to some favorable things we've got for students, right? If they Hope go to so. tinyurl.com slash AP Latin 2022 review, there's a resource holder, um, practice exercises, close exercises, links to helpful websites. It's all there for you. That was a great transition, by the way. So you should do something like that in your essay. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. All right. Um, gratias. Met. Yes. Gratias. Um, walete, Womnes. We will see you tomorrow for more Aeneid review.